Please help me welcome Mira Serena. Thank you for uh, stopping by. I hear you did a, a really, really great uh, master class with the acting students today. Great. Well, it was my first. Uh, I don't usually think of myself as a teacher, but I guess I'm getting older. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, well, what, what sort of things did you do? Did you take questions from them, or did, was it a lecture? How did that No, work? they actually uh, did. They performed scenes from the screenplay, not having seen the film. They were given five scenes from Nancy and Mary Teller's screenplay of Union Square, mm -hmm. and they performed it really well. And the idea was for them to perform it once and then get like notes from me, and then to do it again, and in the process talk all about the business, the uh, you know the artistic process, mm -hmm. and whatever other bits of random things you know came out of my head in yeah. that moment that might help them on their journey because they're all young professional actors, and they did amazingly. They. They took them on, and it was interesting to see five different iterations of these two sisters that you're going to enjoy tonight. And since they'd never seen the film, it had nothing to do with my work or my origination of the role. So I was like, okay, it's not my role. It's, it's a piece of literature that anybody can take their own whack at. It was really neat to, to be a part of it and to... Uh, to work with such intelligent, eager, uh, talented people. Right, and see it through different eyes for a change. I mean, yes. it must have been like this audience tonight will see the movie for the first time. Was it sort of like seeing it afresh? Uh, yeah, yeah, In definitely. And, and seeing different ways that the scenes could be played or taken. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think I kind of directed them back towards the way that Nancy ultimately right. had us do it, but you saw that there could be a real range of how you could play these people. Well, it's interesting because you, the film was shot in two weeks, but you rehearsed a great deal beforehand. Tell me a little bit about that. It wasn't actually rehearsing. It was a rehearsal week in which Nancy kind of transmitted to us her world that she was depicting in this film. You know, she's half Italian uh, from the Bronx, her other half is Argentine, and she lived in South America for a while. But uh, this is about women and she she talked about relatives of hers and she said it's not specific to anyone she's changed everything so that she doesn't offend anyone and she wouldn't tell us what parts were true and what parts were fiction but she said that you know in the old days when someone was bipolar they used to call them nervous that they had a nervous right, temperament right. and that 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 was just sort of common that some of their aunts were nervous and my character Lucy is nervous uh, uh, she's she's bipolar and uh, but as you'll see in the, the story, you know, everybody has a secret in this, and no one is what they seem to be at the beginning, at least the women. The men are actually fairly straightforward, right. good eggs. Right. We're, we're more complicated. Um, and she just kept showing us through her stories and her oral transmission kind of the vibe of everything, and then we, we kind of talked over backstories and things like that. But we really didn't rehearse. Right. Is the backstory important for you as an actor, or can you just sort of accept what's on the page as being uh, what you will portray? Do you need to know the character's history? Uh, I need to know it for myself. Right. It doesn't need to be what the director had in mind if she hasn't or he hasn't specified. Then I'll make one up that serves me best. I was talking today about making choices that, uh, as my uh, old acting teacher, Bryn Hammond, said, you know, you have to find the pinch that creates the ouch. So you have to come up with something that you feel strongly about, that you can go to in your mind and your heart while you're playing the character, that gives you the emotional goods to play the role. So you had to inform scenes or story points or family members in your head with things that did something to you viscerally, and that, that loads that preloads your ammunition, so when you get to those parts, it all has the resonance it's supposed to. Right, right. Now, I'm, I'm talking about the movie in very general terms, because of course no one here has seen it right, yet, right. so uh, you have a plane to catch uh, tonight, so we were talking about it before the screening, but um, tell me then a little bit about the character, because as you say, she's bipolar, uh, and you have to find a balance within the performance then, between uh, those times when she's a little bit more calm, and the times when she's not so calm. Tell me a little bit about finding that balance and then keeping it believable for an audience. Well, in the first 10 minutes of the film, I got worried that we were going to lose the audience. So um, 
<laughs> uh, be warned that you're going to find my character annoying and almost unbearably. We're scary. locking the doors here for the first <laughs> 15 be, minutes. Okay. So. But, you know, I thought, wow, we're going to drive people out because they're going to say she's unbearable. She gets too much drama. I can't handle it. Right. Uh, and that's exactly how her sister feels <laughs> right. as well. Um, but then she turns on a dime, and when things make her happy, she brightens up. She doesn't hold a grudge. She's somebody who can really be in the moment mm -hmm. and find delight in the moment. And she's got a very ebullient personality when she's in a great mood. And she's often in a great mood. It goes up and down and up and down. And uh, you know, you just had to chart the course. And Nancy and I talked about it in the beginning. In the beginning, I think it was written in the script that she broke down crying seven times, and I felt that would be too much. And I think right. now it's like five or four and a half. Because <laughs> I was just like, you know, if she cries all the time, we're not going to feel for her when she does. And, and it's going to exhaust people. So maybe some moments we can choose to be a little bit less, you know, and, and we'll, we'll kind of gauge it and mod modulate it. Right. Well, in a lot of this film, I'm trying not to give it any away, a lot of this film happens inside, in, in an apartment, but there are scenes outside, one in particular in Union Square, which was shot kind of guerrilla style, and people actually came and said, are you okay? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Tell us about that. Well, that's that, that first scene that you're going to see, and in it, you know, I'm on the phone having a, you know, to my character, devastating conversation, and I fall apart, and, and I just start weeping. And a woman ran up to me and she said, are, are you okay? And, you know, we have a camera there, but it was a small Canon 5D. The whole thing was shot on that camera. We had two of them. Which are only, like, this big, right? They're not, they're... they're... Like, you know, the camera he's using there. That might be the Canon. Is that the Canon? No, they are. Uh, okay, well, it's similar body shape and size. Yeah. So it looks like a still camera because it is, in fact, also a still camera. And people don't necessarily notice that you're shooting a movie and we had a skeleton crew. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were running around very guerrilla style. And it was nice to see the New Yorkers cared about a stranger who's crying. That, that was very nice. Um, but even in the farmer's market scene, I, I got into an argument with this one vendor when I was asking him for something on this list that you'll see, I, I, we're searching for ingredients. And he got mad at me because I said something that offended him. And then later he signed a release, and so he's in the movie, but just a real guy, because it's a real moment and a real conversation. So it was very gracious of him to allow his kind of nastiness to end up on screen. <laughs> Did, did shooting that way, and I don't mean necessarily the gorilla stuff outside, but shooting with the smaller cameras and a skeleton crew change the performance and change the way that you shot this film rather than shooting something that's a bit We got to shoot it sequentially, which is right. almost unheard of. Right. We shot it from the beginning to the end with a couple of minor adjustments because of, of uh, Michael Rispoli's availability, I think. Mm -hmm. and, and the one club scene was only, the club was only available one night. Um, but that was amazing because we were able to see how scenes played and then modify the way the next scene played based on how the last one went. And usually you have to pre-guess that. You've got to say, well, by that point we will have played that moment, so then we'll feel this way. But you never really know until you get there. And, and so it's, it's, a, it's an approximation. Usually this time it was really unfolding. And Nancy started rewriting the third act based on the way it was going. Which was it was it was phenomenal. It was really a great way to work. I loved it. Yeah, sort of like organic filmmaking. Almost. Yeah, very yeah. organic. Like we were in their lives, and their lives were sort of happening to us, and surprising things would happen. And and Nancy also encouraged me in my uh, sort of improvisational bent. I love improvisation, and I always ask, you know, is, you know, is that okay? Can I can I throw some things in? When I feel, yes, yes, go for it. So there's a lot of Lucy that was improvised. Right. Not so much of of of. Uh, Jenny or Mike Doyle. I think Mike Rispoli also improvised a lot. Right, right, right. Um, tell me uh, what you think the underlying message of the film is. I took away, because again, we're talking in sort of very general terms, but um, you know, for me, when I, I saw this during the film festival here in Toronto, and I remember walking out and, and thinking about it a great deal in the walk home, and thinking, you know, this is really an underlying point. It's a movie about truth, and how truth, I think, is the, the, the basis of relationships. If you can get to that, everything else will fall into place. That's interesting. Yeah, I haven't heard it put that way. Uh, I, I, Is that I another way of saying that's wrong? No, 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 no I, I like that. I, I, I've, I've been very, uh, I've dumbed down the whole thing to relatives. You can't live with them, you can't shoot them, so you have to find a way to love them. <laughs> but it is ultimately about love winning out over dis differences and, and distance. Right. And realizing that before it's too late, 
you have to try and, and repair and build bridges and get back to each other because it's too much of a loss to just turn your back on the people that you once were very close to and once loved and then had some problem with. And most families have some of those relationships in them. Right. Now, I know people are very anxious to see the film. I have two more questions uh, that are veering slightly off uh, from Union Square. Uh, tell me about Perfect Sisters. You play a Winnipeg mother. Uh, actually, it's a Toronto mother. Is it? It's it was shot in Winnipeg. Right. It's a true story that occurred in Toronto. And it was about these two girls known as the bathtub girls. Do you know about this? Drown their mother. Yes. And I play a veteran alcoholic who just cannot stay sober. And she tries and, and, and kind of fights a fight, but when bad things happen to her, when she has a disappointment, when she loses a job, she topples and crumples and she doesn't have the inner strength to pull herself back up, not even for her daughter's sake. And then therefore she exposes them, played by um, Abigail Breslin and George Henley, yeah. to all sorts of evil, including the molestation attempts of uh, my good friend James Russo, <laughs> who plays my boyfriend, but also really is trying to, you know, trying to abuse one of them. Right. right. And he's the nicest man in person. I don't know if you've seen him in hundreds of films, yeah, really. Yeah, he's, he's very recognizable. A actor, great yeah. actor, and he always plays a bad guy, and in real life, he's the sweetest, funniest, nicest man. So. You love to hate him. <laughs> I guess. Um, and also, I just wanted to ask, and this is the silly question, uh, tell me about the Veritones. Oh, the Veritones. Yeah. Uh, that's an acapella group that I was one of the family members of my freshman year at Harvard, and now it lives on, and it's one of the major acapella groups on campus now. Yeah. And I stayed with it until, I think my junior year, I think senior year, I didn't do it because I was writing a thesis and I was busy, 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 but... Um, you know, I sang, I had a solo in the song Only You by Yaz. Really? Yes. <laughs> Can you favor us with a, a little bit of that? Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah. Okay. Would you like a sip of water before we begin? Uh, no, this is, I can't believe this is going to end up on YouTube or something. Uh, <laughs> Turn your cameras off now. Uh, um, Looking from a window above, it's like story of love. Can you hear me? Came back only yesterday, I'm moving further away. Won't you near me? All I needed was the love you gave. All I needed for another day, and all I ever knew, only you. Wow. 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 <laughs> I didn't think you'd really sing. <laughs> that was awesome. Thank you, Marissa. Thank you so much for being thank here. You.